Hi, I'm Meredith. I'm a dietitian. I may not be your dietitian. So if I'm not your dietitian, please don't take this as medical advice and please consult with your own healthcare provider prior to making changes to your diet, your medications, or your lifestyle or your supplements. And this video is specifically about functional B6 deficiency. And if you have liver disease, this video is for you because I believe that this is the cause of elevated liver enzymes. Um, so I think that there is a type of B6 deficiency going unnoticed in literature. And my family has experienced this as well as my clients. And so I decided to go on a detective journey to figure out why people were still struggling with B6 reactions or B6 dependent reactions despite taking B6. And also why my clients would have feelings of toxicity um, or actually it would be deficiency, but they're being told that they have toxicity of B6 because their blood levels are high, but they have all the signs of a B6 deficiency such as burning sensations in their hands and struggling with neurological function. So um, here is my hypothesis of what is happening. Let me move myself down just a little bit. So this is the possible mechanism of functional B6 deficiency and also damage to cell membranes. So this, again, this video somewhat pertains to liver disease because the reason why liver enzymes start to leak into the blood is because the liver is damaged and that is because cell membranes are damaged. So the driving force behind my hypothesis of functional B6 deficiency is actually excess reactive oxygen species and specifically, um, I think that there's an excess amount of nitric oxide. So nitric oxide in small amounts can be good for the body. It's a vasodilator. Um, you have different enzymes called like INOS. INOS is inducible nitric oxide. You have ENOS, which is epithelial nitric oxide. There's a mitochondrial version of that enzyme. And then there's also a, neuro, a nerve version of that or neurological version. And so, um, I believe that people are relying more and more on INOS because they're having problems um, either having low CO2 levels, which will CO2 normally controls your vasodilation. So if your CO2 goes low, then your body's gonna upregulate INOS to take care of your vasodilation. The second thing that I think is happening is that when the CO2 levels drop too low, then the body is struggling to make hydrogen sulfide. And hydrogen sulfide is actually what controls vasodilation in the tiny blood vessels. And so again, the body wants to do this so it makes INOS upregulation so that you make more nitric oxide, but it becomes too much nitric oxide. So that nitric oxide impairs methyltransferase or methionine synthesis, the other name for that. And that's a B12 and 5-methylfolate dependent enzyme. And so when nitric oxide blocks the ability for that enzyme to work, there's a backup pathway because we're well designed. And the backup pathway uses an enzyme called betaine hydroxymethyltransferase or transferase or BHMT, and that uses betaine. So betaine helps to convert homocysteine to methionine. Okay. We can eat betaine. It's in our diet. If we're not on a gluten-free diet if we um, aren't on a low oxalate diet because it's in whole grain wheat products mostly. It's also in quinoa, it's small amount in oats. Um, of course you would wanna go gluten-free with your, well, you don't have to gluten-free, but you wanna go organic with your oats because of glyphosate. Um, and then it's also in beets, but beets are high in oxalate. So, you may or may not be getting enough betaine in your diet, especially if you're under high amounts of nitric oxide um, or you have a high amount of this. So um, if you don't get it in your diet, then you're going to make it in your body from betaine aldehyde using an enzyme called aldehyde dehydrogenase 7A1 or antiquitin. And antiquitin um, is a moonlighting enzyme. So it plays different roles in the body depending on what the body needs. So under a stressful situation, this enzyme is going to make betaine because nitric oxide levels are too high. 
And then also this enzyme is going to try to stop the damage from lipid peroxidation. So if you have excess reactive oxygen species or you're drinking alcohol or you have excess hydrogen peroxide, which can come from excess vitamin C. So vitamin C is a Goldilocks nutrient, and it means that we need some, but not too much. And so very high dose vitamin C will lead to excessive amounts of hydrogen peroxide through the Fenton reaction. And so that can cause lipid peroxidation. Well, our bodies use ALDH7A1 to basically metabolize these lipid peroxidation products and detoxify them. And that's good because HNE is something that blocks our metabolism or TCA cycle. And that, that alone can lead to liver issues. Okay. This is also happening in the eye. HNE can cause um, uh, cataracts in the eye. MDA is something that happens with Alzheimer's disease that goes up. And then this acroline, I honestly haven't looked this up. <laughs> so I just know that these are lipid peroxidation products and LDH7A1 can detoxify those. So it has these two roles that it plays during oxidative stress. Okay. And so when it's moonlighting, in these two roles, then it's not over here metabolizing lysine. Okay, so there's two pathways to metabolize lysine, and these pathways join up here at P6C and AASA. Okay, so ALDH7A1's mm -hmm. job is to convert, convert this. AASA into AAA, and then it goes to acetyl CoA. So eventually, you can use lysine um, for energy metabolism because acetyl CoA goes through the TCA cycle. Or you could also use this acetyl CoA um, to make acetylcholine, a major neurotransmitter. So there's a lot of things that you can do with your lysine. So if this is actually blocked, so let me put my annotation. So that is it, if this is blocked, let's say that we're not using ALGH781 over here because it's moonlighting elsewhere in the cell to protect it, then you're gonna have increased levels of AASA. And then that's going to move towards P6C and then it can increase hypocolic acid and these kind of go back and forth. So, Hypocolic acid is high in liver disease. That's something that we do know. So this is an actual thing that's happening in liver diseases. There's a buildup of hypocolic acid. That really makes me believe that ALDH7A1 in liver disease is actually moonlighting everywhere else, trying to stop the oxidative damage that's happening and support this methylation pathway over here. So um, the increase in the P6C it actually complexes with your active form of B6 and makes it inactive. So no matter how much B6 you have in your body, you're not using it because it becomes inactive because it's stuck to this P6C. So that's how I think that my clients and my family members have gotten a functional B6 deficiency despite having B6 in our diet and taking B6 supplements. Um, and the burning sensation that um, myself, I had it, <laughs> and a burning sensation in my body that felt so much like neuropathy or fibromyalgia. And I went to the doctor and the only test that I didn't have done was small um, fiber neuropathy tests, but I was tested for regular neuropathy and I didn't have it, but I had this burning sensation on fire um, feeling and cramping of muscles. And I believe that that was the pipicolic acid because pipicolic acid can cause neuropathy type symptoms as well. And um, also because I didn't have very much active B6, I was struggling a lot with, um, you know, my, my hair, it's, it's getting better. It's coming back in some, um, my hair and my skin, my skin was just starting to have like little rough patches. Um, and then also I was immune to mosquito bites. <laughs> now the past two days, 
I am no longer immune to mosquitoes. They can smell me. And I believe that's because I'm making sapienic acid, which is um, made through Delta 60 saturase, which is B6 dependent. So now the side effect of improving my B6 metabolism is I smelled some mosquitoes and I'm here in Texas and I just thought that we didn't have any mosquitoes. I actually even told a friend, there must be a really good ecological balance down here in the country because I get no mosquito bites, <laughs> but it wasn't that. Um, so um, before I move on to tell you like how you can get out of this situation and how I got out of it and how my clients are getting out of this situation, let me tell you about um, the very negative effect of making betaine in your body. So the problem with this is if you have increased needs for betaine and you're not consuming it, then you're going to have to make it. And where you start making it is with phosphatidylethanolamine. So that goes, that's in your cell membranes. It's also in ether lipid. So you need ethanolamine to make your brain run smoothly. So if you start to break down phosphatidylethanolamine from your cell membranes to make phosphatidylcholine, then you're going to have problems with your nervous system, okay? And so another problem that we have, if you happen to have hypervitaminosis A, there's another burden on phosphatidylethanolamine and it's retinal aldehyde. And that is the aldehyde version of, of um, vitamin A and it binds to phosphatidylethanolamine and it makes A2E, which is a lipofuscin. And this has been described in the eyes and it's been described in red blood cells. Um, and so, and also in skin. And so this particular compound is known to displace cytochrome C oxidase from the respiratory chain and make it non-functional. So that increases your reactive oxygen species. So it's super important for you to get betaine in your diet. If you're able to eat foods that are high in betaine, you would want to consume more of that, potentially 500 milligrams a day if you're able. Um, most of my clients though are very sensitive to betaine foods because they're typically high in oxalate and oxalate is something that impairs NAD. Recycling at the level of lactate dehydrogenase, and you can go to a previous video to, to learn about that. So you need your NAD because ALDH7A1 is NAD dependent. Okay, and so you need your NAD. Okay. Um, again, you're going to have your body's going to compartmentalize. So um it's going to use the NAD for survival first. So you want enough NAD in general to be able to help your body survive, but also to move energy metabolism forward. Okay, so now let's look at the things that you can do to stop ALDH7A1 from moonlighting. Well, the first thing you can do is you can decrease your polyunsaturated fat intake because those are the fats that are most likely to go through lipid peroxidation. So those fats would be things like sunflower oil and um, let's see, um, safflower oil. Basically, you would want to look at the packages of the foods that you eat and look for the poofas and try to avoid those foods. Also, eating grass-fed animals would be better than eating corn-fed animals because corn-fed animals typically have more poofa. Then you would want to consume betaine-rich foods. And so... Um, these things would be again like wheat bran or, or beets or quinoa, but beets can induce nitric oxide <laughs> a synthesis. And um, so that might not be the best food to do. Um, so you could look for a list of high betaine foods. Then uh, the next thing I would do is a plasma amino acid test and then take betaine or trimethylglycine. That's my preferred form to take because the betaine HCL, it's, um, I don't think that it works as well. I really don't. I've had clients who have taken betaine HCL in the past and they're like, well, it didn't help me. And um, so it, it has a different, I believe that it's just because the betaine HCL is more of like a, a proton donor to help with stomach acid, whereas betaine anhydrous is for, anhydrous is for um, getting trimethylglycine, which is what we need. Um, I recommend the plasma amino acid test. For my clients, especially if they're very impaired and they have elevated liver enzymes um, or if they have seizure disorder because they need to check for methionine levels, my clients typically are non-speakers. Um, 
So they're not able to usually tell me if they're feeling funny. And so one risk factor for taking betaine is that it can increase your methionine levels too high if you already have high methionine levels and that can lead to brain edema. So betaine is an osmotic agent. So anytime you are gonna supplement it, supplement with it, you would wanna start low and go up slow so you can avoid the, the fluid overload in general. <laughs> And then also, um, again, get a plasma amino acid test and have it checked. And if your methionine is too high, um, you would have to probably figure out why that was happening. And it's probably a slow cystathione B synthase enzyme that's causing it, um, which also, by the way, is B6 dependent. So perhaps your body would be like partitioning B6 towards, uh, or sorry, B6 away from that enzyme potentially. Okay, and then you want to reduce your dietary oxalate level, perhaps, so that you have better NAD recycling. You could consume adequate niacin, um, maybe think about a supplement, and then you would want to induce your nitric oxide inducers, because you're trying to stop your body from having to use betaine in the first place. Um, you would also want to have enough folate and B12 on board for when you stop using betaine, um, so that's something else to consider that I didn't put on this slide. Um, I have another video about going overboard on folate when you're stuck in a BHMT pathway and it'll make you fat. So <laughs> try not to go over the RDA on folate or forms of folate. Okay. And then how to stop your lipid membrane breakdown. You want to eat at least 500 milligrams of choline a day. Um, and you can do that by using chronometer and just plugging in foods into chronometer and see what you come up with. I find that eating two eggs a day just knocks it out and then I don't have to worry about it anymore. Um, also two eggs per day is what helps my clients to get out of elevated liver enzymes, which I believe is a sign of functional B6 deficiency and also leaky membranes. So eating, um, so it really actually helps them get out of the leaky membranes, but it doesn't fix the B6 problem. Um, that would be more of the betaine helping with that. And then phosphatidylcholine supplements can work as well. So you can consult with your own healthcare provider about that. Okay, so I hope you liked my video and um, let me know, have some comments for me, please. And please share the video and like my channel and subscribe, all those good things. I hope you have a blessed day. Bye-bye.